Funding for Lucky Chow has been provided by... Whether you live to eat or eat to live, food is a necessary part of life. In many Asian cultures though, food is much more than sustenance. I'm in Seoul, the capital of South Korea, where food seems to permeate every aspect of daily life. But being a foodie in Korea means much more than just discovering the newest restaurant or chasing down the trendiest ingredient. Here, food is performance art, something that appeals to the eye and the mind as much as the taste buds. Korea is spawning one food trend after another in their permeating American pop culture. When you're in Korea, it's pretty obvious that food is on everyone's mind all the time. I wanted to learn more about the Korean obsession with food, so I called an expert on the topic. Soo Ahn is an American living in Seoul and partaking in its immersive food culture. From K-drama to the Korean art of mukbang, Soo is showing me around Seoul's Ganam district and teaching me how to live and eat like a local. Thank Hi. you so much for meeting me here in of Seoul. Of course, of course, welcome. I feel like I've been to Seoul because of all the entertainment that I've seen about yes. Seoul. There's so much, especially around the food culture. Here, all the socialization, everyone coming together, it really revolves around food. And that's pretty much what the premise of our society is about. So. People are always talking about, do we live to eat or do we eat to live? <laughs> I think in Korea, you eat to have fun. Yes. I'm fascinated by how food is the main character. Exactly, so that's how integrated the food is into our culture. And that definitely also seeps into the K-drama entertainment culture as well. I've seen these K-dramas where these young kids fall in love over their shared interest in say ramyeon or yeah. spaghetti. <laughs> and that's almost like how they court each other is through the food. Absolutely, and the food seems to be the main player. People tend to want to take pictures and they ask about what the story is behind the food, talk to the chefs, and that's really how you connect with the culture and the social scene here. So right now we're at one of the food truck stands called O Mannan Chip. So that means Oh Delicious House, literally. We have a bunch of Korean street food staples right here. Chicken on a stick is sort of a street food mainstay in yes. any culture. Mm -hmm. But here in Korea, of course it has gochujang. Of course. And cheese. I feel like it's making its way into every American refrigerator these days. Oh, really? Yeah. The international perception of Korean food has changed so much in the past couple of years because of the entertainment. Yes. We're like learning about the food through mukbang, for instance. Mm -hmm. Exactly, so people can watch the mukbang BJs and they would just sit there and just eat. Just eat and eat and this fascination I think is especially prominent here because there are so many single member households now that when they're eating alone they want some kind of an entertainment and like someone's eating with them, kind of joining them. Because and traditionally with Korean cuisine it has to be shared. Exactly, more of a communal sense um, and everyone's sipping their chopsticks in each other's food. The one criteria to becoming a mukbang BJ is that you have to eat a lot or is it just yes. about your expressions while eating? Well, the number one criteria I'd say would have to be eating foods that people would be satisfied with. So that means usually in large, large quantities. Well, it's really fascinating that, you know, eating a lot is something that people are falling in love with. We're 
to begin. I know. Well, <laughs> with a curry hot dog, I think. He's very famous for the cheese hot curry that was featured in the picture on TV show. That's so fun yeah. to actually eat or visit the places that you see on TV. Exactly. That's the cheese hot curry. Okay. And this is the suzu. Thank <laughs> Cheers. Cheers, Gampe. Gampe. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> I think I'm experiencing oh. mukbang in real life because that was so oh. satisfying to watch you eat. Would you like to try this as well? Yes, I will. <laughs> this is so good. Oh my gosh. So good. Ooh, happy dance. <laughs> mm. Food really is everywhere in Korea. On the streets, on TV, on your phone, and even in your local toy store. Line Friends began in 2011 as a social media and messaging app that has grown to 600 million users worldwide. The mascot characters created for the app became so popular that they took on a life of their own. Now, there are line stores globally from New York to Shanghai, and of course, their flagship store here in Seoul, where you can share a meal with a line friend. How's it going today, Tony? Food is also on the menu in a place where you wouldn't expect it, at the spa. I'm at the world-famous Dragon Hill Spa and Resort to sweat, shiver, relax, play, and of course, have a delicious Korean meal. Koreans come to spas for lots of reasons to bathe and get in the sauna, or for a cheap night stay, it's about 17 US dollars for a 24 hour stay here. But I came to eat. With this spa and with the food, it's so much about keeping your body's temperature intact. Everything seems to be based on temperature. The charcoal rooms that are based on three levels of heat and then the frigid rooms where I'm literally sitting next to a snowman. And then likewise with the food, seaweed soup is supposed to cool you down in hot days. There's also the cold buckwheat noodles that people eat during the hot days. And then of course, kimchi, a requisite with every Korean meal. This place is really funky. It's unlike any other spa I've actually ever been to. It's gigantic. And then if you get really bored of meditating or soaking or steaming, you can always just go to the video arcade and play your hand. <laughs> it's kind of the best deal in Seoul. Oh, this is really good for on a full stomach. <laughs> what I was so surprised to find here is that there is so much food to go along with your spa adventure. From bibimbap to hot dogs, chicken and beer, shaved ice. You really eat your way to wellness. Hanging out at Dragon Hill Spa has taught me a lot about Korean culture, especially how food and entertainment go side by side. Dembe. Now that I've sampled the spa lifestyle, I'm going to try another Korean invention that combines food and relaxation. Mukbang means eating broadcast, and it's exactly what it sounds like. People film themselves eating large quantities of food, and other people watch them eat from the privacy of their own homes. I wanted to create a mukbang broadcast of my own, so I flew in some help from Chicago. America's first mukbang star, Kimi. Welcome to Chinatown. Thank you. <laughs> thanks for coming from Chicago over here. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. I've been fascinated and watching mm -hmm. you right. ever since you started, but uh -huh. I've always wanted to ask you mm -hmm. how you got started with mukbang. It was about two years ago. I actually just was on YouTube like a normal day and I saw this girl. Uh, she was filming herself. She was a really pretty petite girl eating large amount of food. It was very addictive. Thing to watch. I was hooked, it was entertaining, and it was very comforting. She was speaking Korean. You know, it was um, everything kind of started in South Korea. So I was just looking at the comments, and I actually saw a handful of people asking in English. Oh. Like, oh, what is she talking about? What is she eating? Like, uh -huh. what is this? And my boyfriend and I thought that 
oh, like, it would be kind of cool if we start our own channel, but we talk in English uh -huh. and we eat everything that's available in the States, not South Korea. Hey guys, I got a new griddle. Yay! So you started filming yourself eating mm -hmm. about yeah. two years ago. When yeah. did it become your career? I would say about a year ago. So a year after I started mukbang, it kind of exploded. And I wanted to put 100% like, put of me. So I took the risk and I made it into my career. American dream, right? Yeah, no, it uh -huh. really is. Uh -huh. So I'm really excited and intrigued, actually. I think you're going to give me a lesson, right? Yeah, I'll show you how to All right, fun. let's okay. go. Usually all of my videos, I kind of start the same way. Yes. I would be like, hi guys, you know, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm back with another mukbang with Danielle. Today we have some chicken noodle soup and we have some KFC. You have all these tips for how to make your video just extra appealing to the right. viewer. What are some of them? I definitely think the food needs to be closer to the camera. You need to see more of the food than myself because majority of my viewers do come for the food, like, you know, more than just me. Do you make three? So what we got here? A lot of food. Take out the whole oh, bucket, this is, family oh my gosh, size. So heavy. <laughs> You're like a food stylist. I mean, I was watching your videos and it really is an art. It's right. Like, it has to be appetizing. Yeah. You know? Okay. Those are done. And yeah. Yeah, let's just dig in. All right. Okay. Well, show me how it's done. How do you choose what foods to cook? Um, usually, I have cravings and uh -huh. But you know, like I can't eat same thing every week or every day. So I try to be more um, diverse, and I try to mix and match a Korean and American. Mm. Yeah. So it's it's something that uh, not other mukbangers do. So I think I guess that makes me stand out a little bit more. So I'll give you a lot. <laughs> Is that like part of the fascination with mukbang to be eating like big amounts of? not so good for you food? When it comes to mukbang, a lot of people want to see you take bigger bites. Mm. Like, compared to like normally I would, if I'm eating alone, I would take like this much. Mm -hmm. But when I'm filming mukbang, I would like really? grab like double amount of food. I think people like to see your mouth full when, you know, someone petite like you, eating a lot of huge portion of food and they can finish it, it's very satisfying, it's entertaining. Mm. But I think that's one of the misconceptions that people have of mukbang mm -hmm. because mukbang literally translates into eating broadcast. So, mm. I, but it is definitely more popular. So then are you mostly eating when you're doing your videos or are you chatting and mm -hmm. talking to your viewer? I mean, I do try to share about my ups and downs to kind of tell the audience that it's okay. Being a mukbanger, uh -huh. I play a huge role of being a virtual friend. I want them to feel like, uh, you know, we're not physically together, but you know, like we're kind of in this together. So with the chicken, a lot of people like to hear the sound of it because um, mm. usually they're really crunchy and like when you bite into it, it gets really juicy. That's why I like to have my microphone next uh -huh. to me. Have you heard of ASMR? Yeah, I was going to ask you, what uh -huh. does that mean exactly? It stands for autonomous. Sensory meridian response. Uh -huh. It's basically like when somebody's whispering in your ear and you kind of like tingle a little bit, right? Uh -huh. And it can be from biting into crunchy chicken to like tapping something. It doesn't always have to be food related, but some people find it kind of satisfying. You know, actually a lot of people like the gulping sound too. Like, they like the oh. sound a lot. Yeah. You do that really well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How do you do that? You have to teach me. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a w <laughs> I can't I can't without burning. <laughs> no. I'm that, sorry. That is really soothing. That is like the sound of the ocean. How should we sign off? Oh well <laughs> usually when I'm really full or um, when I'm done eating, I would just be like, okay, well, I'm gonna end the video here. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this video. Like this video, subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time. <laughs> <Yay>! <laughs>
When I think of Asian staples, the first thing I think of is rice. But there's another humble starch with a long history. This exhibit at the Charles B. Wong Center at Stony Brook University celebrates the potato in all of its Asian glory. I took a tour of the show called Potasia with the exhibit's co-curators to see how the potato has affected and inspired Asian art throughout history. As soon as I heard that there was an exhibit all about potatoes, I had to come. Can you tell me more about it? You are at the Charles B. Wong Center. It's an Asian art and culture center. We do uh, offer a lot of variety of uh, Asian culture programs, including exhibitions. This is all about humble potato as related to Asian culture. It's called Potasia and Potatoism in the East. So we explore potato as a culture icon as related to Asian culture. Surprising enough, it has inspired many Asian artists and also it served as an artistic manifestation of social and political changes. Can you show me some of your favorite pieces? Sure. Here, potato is a primary subject of all entire socialist poster collection. Even though it shows really vibrant color and energetic people, it represents often poverty and sorrow and their shortage. But at the same time, it shows the future abundance. These posters really show how food teaches you about mm -hmm. history. When you look at these happy, colorful right. images, you don't realize mm -hmm. that this was made during the Great Leap Forward, right. which caused and a lot of famine. You see these posters hanging in Chinese restaurants now almost as kitsch, devoid of right. historical context. Right. Well, these are very ornamental. It is actual potato painted in gold. She's contrasting the beautiful peony flower with the decaying, sprouting potato as uh, her manifestation of beautiful dream, yet a fragile reality. This is so intriguing. This is a ambiguous form of potato. Potato usually you know, kept in a dark to prevent growing of the sprout. And I think that she was kind of kept in a dark, you know, not to grow as an artist. This artwork is a metaphor for herself as an artist. And I think she really expressed well the duality of potato in here. What do you want people to take away from this exhibit? I'd like to have a more uh, flexible idea about Asia itself. Asia is not always old and historical. It is growing and changing. Potasia co-curator Jeffrey Allen Price isn't your typical potato fan. He's more like a fanatic, or what the Japanese call an otaku. Jeffrey has thousands of potato-related memorabilia, food items, and art from around the world. I first came to the potato as a vegetarian, and then I thought about it as a conceptual art project. And the more I researched about the potato, it just became this interesting symbol where I was finding instances in movies and in music, and it led me to understand that the potato was this worldwide cultural phenomenon, that all cultures use the potato. How many pieces of potato art do you have in this exhibition? This is a sampling of my collection. These are all Asian themed. There's a, a little over 100. What about in your entire collection? The entire collection is well over 5,000 pieces. 5,000? Yes. Why don't I show you one of my favorite objects in the collection? This is a stereo viewer. This particular one is a potato stall in Japan. You see uh, almost a three-dimensional view of this. Amazing, from 1896? Uh -huh. So we do have real potato food. This shows how the potato is ubiquitous in snack foods. I love it, and so this Lay's potato chip from China has seaweed, whereas this one from Thailand has... Lime it's... and, uh, well, it's mikam grabus. So it's localized for, exactly. the, for the palates. What's with this? Well, here we see that a potato can run electricity. So we have a sweet potato clock. We have simple electrodes, and it's running a, a very simple clock here. So you're a multidisciplinary artist. <laughs> That's right. And this is a film that I'm working on. This is how I say potato. Alu. Pomme de terre. Potato. So I'm getting as many different languages and accents and nicknames for the potato as I can. I'm also interviewing them about their own personal stories. And I'm trying to tell the story of the potato around the world through this film. 
Thanks to you both, I'm never gonna look at a potato the same way again. Food can be art in many forms, not all of them edible. For his nonprofit educational program, Project Origami, Ben Hu teaches children how to turn paper into colorful, elaborate sculptures of food to raise awareness of art and to relieve stress. I found his work so beautiful and impressive that I featured it in a recent Lucky Rice feast in Los Angeles. The theme for the feast was Breaking Bao, and Ben's intricate origami bao, sushi, and peppers fit right in. Tisha Cherry's art is definitely edible, though you may not want to spoil it by eating it. Tisha, who grew up in her family's Thai restaurant, takes the idea of playing with your food to a whole new level. One of her specialties is Oreo cookie portraits, which she shares with her thousands of Instagram followers. Today, she's gonna to show me what she can do with some fruits and vegetables from my go-to neighborhood market. Tisha, I'm excited to have you at my favorite grocery store, yeah. which I hope will be your favorite art supply store. Absolutely. <laughs> so we'll grab a pineapple. I'm gonna envision it to flip it around and kind of shape it as a bird. Do you only use food as your medium for yes. the work? Yes. yes. That's the challenge. I'm like an old Chinatown lady. I have to like touch, touch every, I know every single piece of one. Fruit. You grew up in a restaurant family, Correct. right? Absolutely. So Thai cuisine is really known for its intricate, elaborate food art. Did you start making those beautiful rose flowers from an early age? A few Sundays a month, we would go to the temples. They would carve all this fruit art and just have it on display to give to the monks. So I was exposed to it a lot and I was just intrigued. Do you share your art through mostly just social media? I work a nine to five, so I share most of my work on social media. It's just instant. I play, I, I take a picture, and I eat, and that's really how yeah. it is. <laughs> well, I can't wait to get to work, actually, and Yay! see what you're making today. Bye. What is that? <laughs> so I made a cookie of you. I started my food art just kind of making cookie portraits. That is such myself. a special gift. Thank you so much. <laughs> I would have never thought to ever meet a cookie photo of myself. I mean, it's so realistic. You must have a background in art. Absolutely not. <laughs> so the, it's still just trial and error. Do you always make your own dough or do you have a favorite cookie you work with? I do make my own dough, um, but I also love the Oreo cookie. Well, what really struck me about your work was that it was really playful. There was the play on words. You couldn't tell if it was actually a painting or a photo or something edible. Every year, Oreo comes out with limited edition flavors. Halloween, it's orange. Christmas time, there's a winter Oreo that's red. I mix colors together to do like a skin tone, like I've done a Van Gogh. So Oreos really are your tubes of paint, essentially. Yes. What are we doing today? So we're gonna start off by making tomato roses. So what we do, we kind of angle it off to the side and then we're just gonna rotate and bring it down to the next level. Let me try this. I have more respect now for all the amazing <laughs> roses that I see right? at Thai restaurants. <laughs> and you're just gonna roll it in really, really gently. Okay. That's so great! <laughs> and you can put it in your hair, right? Like, hey! Oh, yes. <laughs> what shall we do next? You tell me. <laughs> Let's do pineapple. I am envisioning a bird. Okay. Can like, you envision yeah, it? Yeah. Got that. <laughs> <laughs> Your work is really conceptual. I mean, it's different from like traditional fruit carving because it's not just about beautifying something. I'm kind of relating it to like what's relevant to. Migos did a, a song about stir fry and like how uh -huh. could I not do it? So one of my most recent <laughs> posts is the guise of Migos and I painted them out of soy sauce and then I made stir fry around it. That's really fun. So you get your inspiration <laughs> from pop culture. Yes. This is gonna be a bird's tail. Mm -hmm. This will be the bird's head. When I was younger, what I would do is just look at this mm -hmm. and kind of think about what else looks like this, mm -hmm. right? So it could be a turtle's shell or like a reptile. So I'd appreciate the texture and the color. I love your imagination. <laughs> it's so bizarre. <laughs> I recently kind of told more people, but I have ADHD. Mm. And it's not the, oh, I can't focus and sit down, or I need Adderall to focus. I actually hate taking it, but I am more focused. So it's one of those things where this really is therapeutic for me. Really? <laughs> yes. 
So here we wow. are. That's oh. like a bird's head, right? Yes, For it one is. Side. Actually, it looks both sides. I'm not sure if this will work, but we'll try. Ooh. <laughs> Does that work? Ta-da. It's a bird. It's gorgeous. <laughs> Now we're going to cut the cheese. Okay. <laughs> a really fun word play for me is cheese. This would be the base of a camera. Uh huh. And then we're going to get the lens. All right, beautiful. This is so fun. This is why kids love to play with their food. Right, because the, the imagination. Yeah. Say cheese. Cheese. Can we take a selfie? The double selfie. I had so much fun today, and really the best part was getting a peek into your imagination <laughs> in your process. I love that when you came over here, you probably did not know that this was what you were going to make today. No, and so know. it's just such an organic process. Well, thank you. All right, so what would you name this? Two can do it. I like that. So two can do it. And if you ever need an assistant, <laughs> you know where to find me. <laughs> If I learned anything from these travels, it's that people around the world use food to nourish their souls as much as their bodies. When it comes down to it, food can be art, pop culture, and even a viral sensation. And as delicious as it tastes, someone else might see what's on your plate in a totally new light. Funding for Lucky Chow has been provided by <laughs> To learn more about Lucky Chow, visit LuckyRice.com.